Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I welcome you to this afternoon session of the Festival of Ideas entitled uh, Repeat Conversations, Is Gender Back on the Agenda? And our speaker this afternoon is Wendy McCarthy. Uh, feminism has been one of the most powerful social movements of the last 50 years, and uh, educator and advocate Wendy McCarthy will explore why, after 40 years of progress, questions of gender equality and discrimination are still on the agenda. Wendy is also featured in the May edition of the Griffith Review. Wendy is an experienced manager and company director. She currently chairs Headspace, Circus Oz, McGuire Estate Agents, and Pacific Friends of the Global Fund. Wendy began her career as a secondary school teacher and is passionate about the power of education. For four decades, she's been a teacher, educator, and change agent in Australian public life. In 2005, she completed a decade as the Chancellor of the University of Canberra. Her national consulting business, McCarthy Mentoring, specialises in providing mentors to major corporations, the public sector, and not-for-profit organisations. She's the author of seven books. In 1989, she was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia for outstanding contributions to community affairs, women's affairs, and the bicentennial celebrations. In 2003, she was awarded a Centenary of Federation Medal for Business Leadership. And in 2005, she was nominated by the Sydney Morning Herald as one of Australia's top 100 public intellectuals. Uh, Wendy will now address us, and uh, afterwards we'll uh, be um, uh, overjoyed to take your questions for about 20 minutes. So without further ado, can I ask you to give a warm welcome to Wendy McCarthy. Well, thank you very much for that um, introduction, Anthony, and it's very good to be here, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that other group who's back on the agenda, the traditional owners of the land, and pay my respects to them. A few weeks ago, a man about my age came to me and said, isn't it fantastic we're talking about gender? And I thought, hmm, I might just qualify for the Grumpy Old Women show if somebody my age comes along as though this is the first conversation in Australia about gender and uh, thinks that it's exciting. And I said to him, well, frankly, if you'd been engaged for the last 20 years, instead of just off making money, um, we might be a lot further advanced. And I, it's very generous of you now to start mentoring women for board appointments and doing other things, but actually I have a slightly different view. And I started to think about it, and it was just towards the end of last year, actually, not a couple of weeks ago, and I decided to start writing down some of the things that I thought about that and where the balance sheet was on feminism. And I wanted to remind people that actually we've been having this conversation quite intensely in Australia since the late middle to late 60s. Now, we all, of course, identify the beginning of the conversation when we ourselves became, become engaged. And, of course, with this guy... I'd have to acknowledge that this is his first sense of engagement. But on reflecting with my husband later, who knows this man, he said, yes, but he used to cross the street rather than speak to you when you were a feminist. And so somehow gender has crept back onto the agenda, but without feminism. And I think that's a particular challenge. It's not just about the F word. It's about what informs the debate and the discussions. So let me just go back and have a, be a little bit nostalgic about how we got to be here. And I want to start by saying that I often think about the world as a world of clubs. And the significant clubs in the world are religion. And don't tell me it doesn't matter. People die every day because of it. Maybe even some are saved. There's a club called Business, which is about wealth creation, and we need it. And religion is actually, I should say, is also about spirituality, and we need it. We need religion and spirituality. We need wealth creation, business. We need government to regulate our societies. And we need to think about how we elect those governments, what sort of leadership we put in place, and what sort of rules we want around our world. And there's this other kind of group in there called the community. And somehow or other, we don't always see them closely connected. And if you think about religion, does a pop-up come in your head about the woman who's leading all the religions of the world? I don't think so. And when you think about business, and that's particularly so in Australia, it's very hard to think of it other than as a male construct, peopled by male people. 
And if we think about government, things have changed a bit. We've got female premiers, prime minister, governor general, governors. So that's begun to change, but it's a relatively recent change. And I think on reflection, I see that as the culmination of about 40 years' work. And that's a very long time to wait for significant change. So while we dance in the street with excitement when Quentin or Julie or Anna or Joan or Carmen or whoever came there, we also have to remember that we are dancing for the sake of the crumbs thrown to us. And we need to think about what is our entitlement in terms of sharing the responsibility for the leadership and management of the world we live in. We've always been much better represented in the not-for-profit and the community world, sometimes referred to the grassroots. But as Faye Weldon was very fond of saying, the only thing that happens in the grassroots of women is they get rooted. And you need to think very carefully about how you manage that. And I've always thought that the not-for-profit sector was a wonderful learning space for people to learn leadership and community management and so on. And I've now, you know, I'm now bemused by the fact that so many not-for-profits feel the need and to overpopulate their governance with businessmen. As though somehow or other, that is a new model and a new behaviour and uh, that needs to be learned in order for the, the not-for-profits to be successful. So why, how has this happened? How is it that every time we seem to win something and be ahead, we slip back? And is the budget, is the balance sheet positive or negative um, as a result of the feminist movement? Well, I think the good news is that it's definitely positive. We are a lot better off as women than we were 40 years ago. But when I think about my life in the 60s and 70s and 80s, gender was the thing that I got out of bed for. Gender was the central stage in my, the lens at which I looked at the world, the way in which I evaluated things, the way I, the, the, the challenges that I saw of barriers to be pushed down and so that people could make their way through the world. And it never ever occurred to me that change would be other than linear and incremental that if we did certain things, there would be particular consequences. And it seemed to me that we had to pick up the, when, as in the early 60s, in the late 60s and 70s, we had to pick up the feminist agenda, whether we call that women's liberation, women's electoral lobby subsequently or not. It was an agenda about where, if certain things happened, that we then would be in a place where we could move forward and we could, terrible phrase, sorry about that, um, that we could actually gain, start to challenge some of the assumptions about what it was to be female in Australia. And the Women's Electoral Lobby, when they ran their national questionnaire, I think found a lot of the answers to what the political world thought about what it was to be female. My local member of parliament, um, in the seat of Benelong, um, at, at that time, before John Howard, uh, was a man called Sir John Cramer. And in response to what are the greatest attributes a woman could bring to the political life, he said that virginity was highly prized. <laughs> now, those of us who had lost it wondered if we had any residual value at this stage. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, there seemed to be a lot of smiling and kissing of babies around election time, so how did it happen? What was the story around this? And while we laughed at that at one level, in fact, it was deeply shocking because actually he believed it. And he hadn't said it to be facetious or silly. So we discovered an enormous amount about the task in place. So what were the early demands? They were equal pay, and as Mary Gordon said, we've won it three times in court, but still not there. Certainly family planning, we didn't talk, we didn't use words like reproduction or fertility at that stage. We said family planning, um, the right to termination of pregnancy, we say now, but actually it was then called abortion on demand. It was education for women and girls. Um, and, it, and it was, we, we didn't actually ask in there about leadership. 
So we still didn't see, it was almost, we still didn't see that that was, could be an entitlement. That came much later. And I really want you to think about that because I think that's part of our issue at the moment, the sense of how we define what leadership might mean for us and what is our model and does it have to be a specific female model? And that's something that we might talk about in, in question time. So we got to work on what we saw was an agenda that would bring women into mainstream running of political life. And political parties listened, were listening to us. They were competing for our favours and we were on a roll. And we could not see for one minute that anything was going to stop us. That sense as the barriers fell, that the government would keep committing to us. And in my particular case, I went to work, well, I was a teacher, and I, I was a lobbyist in family, around childbirth and family planning. A lobbyist in a very ingenue 1960s outspoken kind of a way. And that I'd never done anything like this before in my life, but there was this deep passion about injustice and the need. And for me, the first barrier to go down was having my husband there when I had a baby. Sounds a bit quaint now because you didn't, you know, now if you don't have the entire extended family there when you birth, they think there's something wrong with you. But that time you had to fight to get your husband there. And you had to fight not to have drugs. As one obstetrician said to me, well, I just say to my girls, lie back and I'll give you something nice and you'll wake up and you'll have a baby. And even I, as about to be a mother the first time, knew that could not be true. It was one of the great public lies. So we won that battle and it seemed to me a natural progression there. If you could birth in the way you wanted to, you should be able to decide whether or not to birth. And that took me to abortion and to, and to family planning. But meanwhile, that was, that was my side activities while I was having three children. In the meantime, I was trying to be a teacher. There was no maternity leave. In my time, you had to leave um, the public sector um, when you were married. And uh, although I just missed that, the general assumption was because I'd gone to live overseas that you would never become a permanent worker again. So we were not being groomed to the idea because merit was not the standard by which you got promoted. It was time serving. It was all about seniority. So if you interrupted your career, and then I understood, you had very little chance of getting back. And that's why I understood then those fabulous women I work with in my first teaching school, the women in the staff room who were well-read, well-informed, great teachers, but they're all casuals. So they couldn't hold a significant position. And they were the ones, bless them, who forced me to sit down and read Betty for Dan, which in a way wouldn't make a lot of sense to a 20-year-old, but I've never forgot it. So, some, so something happened. So what was happening there is when I went to work at family planning when I realised that I had no future as a teacher and that it was no future to change anything, to be influential, to have a permanent appointment, to make a career. Because until that time, we had jobs. We didn't have careers. And there's a very big difference in cultural thinking about whether you have a job or a career. And so I went to work at family planning. And family planning, you know, the first three months of Gough Got Whitlam's prime ministership, um, when he and Lance Barnard had the three months tri um, period of honeymoon where they changed the rules, he took the luxury tax off the oral contraceptive. And that day the oral contraceptive was classified as a cosmetic and it had a luxury tax on the same as lipstick. And it's hard to see the, the connection, but it was. And he took it off, made this wonderful speech about the right of women to have contraception and, uh, and to take that off. And that was the first, one of the first things that went over. He set up Girl School and Society to look at why girls weren't finishing high school and how they might. And I got to work a little bit on that too. So governments were responding to those. We fought an equal pay case and won it. And we, we had that opportunity. And in, the, in public life, in NGOs like Family Planning and Women's Electoral Lobby, the chance to be put pressure on government and pressure on society were, were, were real. We took a full page ad in the Nation Review and all of us who'd had um, abortions. 
It turned out to be quite a lot of us, really. And uh, the pathway to adulthood in a non-contraceptive world. I remember my mother didn't speak to me for six months after that because I'd never told her. And she found out when she picked up the paper and read it. But we asked the cops to come and arrest us because it was illegal. And of course, no one did. And, it, and as we kept winning these things, we began to understand that just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean it has to stay that way. But we had one great benefit. We were a, not defined by other than what we wanted to achieve. It didn't matter where we'd been to school or who our partners were or even where we lived because Women's Electoral Lobby, which was a more of an organisational structure than Women's Liberation, although they were very codependent in many ways, was able to organise nationally and regionally and locally. And that made a very big difference. Women's voices started to be heard. And once we found our voice, again, it seemed that things would change. Equal opportunity guidelines came in. Every university, every business had one. And affirmative action agency, sex discrimination legislation came through in the 80s. And it seemed that nothing would stop us from taking our rightful place in Australian society. And for me, you know, I was uh, um, part of a, when the Fraser government, part of a National Women's Advisory Council. I was Commissioner for Education and Higher Education. And I think during that time, we learnt a lot that I only see in retrospect, again, to take risks. I got a phone call from someone who said he was Paul Lander, who was the Minister for Education, and it was 1976, and I was working at Family Planning. And he said, I'd like you to go on the Higher Education Board. And I did the complete girl thing, you know. Oh, no, I wouldn't know anything about that. I couldn't do that. He said, I'm going to repeat the invitation, he said, because you give me a lot of grief. He said, that women in education group drives the government crazy. Oh, I thought, that's good. <laughs> well, he said, and I am sick of hearing you all complain. Because at that stage, you were trying to get women mature women's access through to education and in increase it. And he said, I'm so sick of it, he said, so I'm offering you a chance to change the system. So, yes or no? And I heard myself saying yes. And it was a high risk for me because I, I said I, what, I didn't know anything and he said, did you go to university? And I said yes. And he said, well, that'll do. And I thought, is that all you have to do to get on the Higher Education Board? You just have to have been to a higher education institution. And actually, when I got there, there were 17 men and me, and actually that's all you did have to do, really, <laughs> other than be a male engineer at AWA, of which there were 15. Now, I couldn't quite understand what their particular skills were in this direction, but there I was. So I learnt to start saying yes to risk and opportunity. And when he said to me then, you know, now you can go on the uh, Education Commission you can, as the Higher Education Board's um, representative, I said, I don't think they'll like that. And he said, who cares? And I thought, well, who does care? <laughs> Not me. So, and I, I can still see the face of the very nice bloke who assumed it was his rightful inheritance because seniority was the cultural paradigm, who had been waiting for 20 years to be the next commissioner, to be the first commissioner from the Higher Education Board. And the look of shock and horror on his face when it was publicly announced that it would be me. And I don't take any particular joy in that, but it was the look that said, why are the newcomers getting opportunities that rightfully belong to us? And that, of course, is one of the pathways that we have to, you, you have to back yourself to do it. And I know when I, was, uh, when I got a phone call on a Sunday night in 1983 and it said, you know, Sunday night, 7 o'clock, three more or less marauding children, and, uh, and, and it said, Senator John Button here, and I said, hello, Senator Button. Never, I'd never met him. And he said, I'd like you to go on the... Uh, would you like to go on the ABC board? I'm thinking, ABC board? Oops. And I'm about to say no, and I'm thinking, yep, I remember when I went there to the higher education thing, they didn't know, and I said, yeah, I'd love to. 
Anyway, he said, I'll, I'll call you later. So I got off and I said to my husband, you know, I've got, just got invited to the ABC board. He said, don't be ridiculous. Someone just, you know, thinks, someone's playing a joke. So I thought, I oh, must be. What broadcasting experience did I have? Well, I did a sex education show with uh, John Singleton on 2KY Radio. Very well listened to, but hardly that. Um, ABC product. And, uh, and as a family planning educator and leader, of course, I'd done a lot of uh, work on radio and I'd done a lot as a, as a feminist voice on, on radio and television. But radio uh, broadcasting management experience, zilch. But I said yes. And they rang back and they said, would I like to be the chair of the ABC? And I said, sure. <laughs> Thinking, oh my God, what am I saying? Anyway, I got off the phone. The next day they rang back and they said, you're the deputy chair. And I thought, well, that's a lucky break. Um, it'd be pretty scary if I was chair. And it transformed my life. And I still think, though, and, and for people to remember, in 1984, no woman read the news. And I asked the directors of radio and television why women didn't read the news. And they said their voices aren't authoritative. Oh, I said, aren't they? And I said, well, what, the only men's? And he said, yes. He said, you know women's voices go up in pitch? I said, no, I don't really. And uh, he said, they do. And I said, and why don't they carry sound equipment? He said, oh, too heavy. I said, how heavy is he? He said, some of, those, some of that gear is 25 kilos. I said, oh, I've seen women humping twins around for about 50 kilos, you know, 25 on each side. Don't think that's a worry. You immediately could see that the assumptions that we've always done it this way. It's like Simone de Beauvoir said when the second sex, that you have to realise you are the other. So you've got to fight your way through somehow and offered an opportunity, it is actually your responsibility to say yes and work out how to do it later. Even though I had spent 10 years telling women in matters of sexuality as a family planning director, say no first and think about it later, I just completely reversed my lines. Say yes first and think about it later. So, given that success and given that, and it's not just about me because there were three women on the ABC board, we decided to caucus in order to change. And before the first meeting, we had a plan of what we'd do. We worked out there'd be a, there would be no recruitment without women on the recruitment panel. This caused the senior officers to say they would not apply for any jobs that we were part of. So we said, well, that's fine, you won't get them. <laughs> um, that's easy. Uh, they did, of course, apply, and some got them, actually. But uh, we also said there would be childcare at every ABC centre. And we just had this long list. There'd be equal pay, there'd be barriers around gear and career opportunities, and we stuck to it rigorously. And it transformed the, vo the, the voices of women in broadcasting. Now it's inconceivable, isn't it, that you would not see women on your screen telling the news, reading the news, informing the news, breaking the news, and as commentators. And I think that when we get, you know, that when people take that for granted, the downside is they assume all the work is done. But in my clubs of the world, one of the things that we, as a group of young feminists, never thought of was business. And at a time when Labor was winning the election, and we didn't have the rise and rise and rise of financial institutions, investment banks and so on, and we, that was not our interest, I don't think we could ever have imagined a world of the 90s and the noughties where that right of the individual, whether it's the Gordon Gecko, or, you know, stereotype, but the person making change, the person revered in the community was the financial jock. We could never have imagined that that's what it would be like. And we could, we probably, I mean, women did not do the, the university courses or the sort of pathways through to those careers that made them part of the challenge. And as the rise and rise of business has dominated in the, in the world of the clubs, business and religion, the two places we are least present, we have been excluded from many of the significant conversations. And my own, you know, sort of, my, my sort of Wendy theory that's emerging for me about this is that having done education brilliantly, because that is the greatest success of the women's movement, the last women's movement, women now outnumber male graduates, and in, in, apart from engineering, which still is a problem, but in most faculties, and certainly 
the old glory ones of the past, medicine, um, law, commerce, women are right up there ahead of men. So why is it that having done what seemed to be the pathway to get into the leadership position, how is it that we're not there? Why is it that we're not talking about, um, why is it that we need to talk again about the lack of women in leadership? There are fewer women on boards than there were in the 1980s. And my view is a lot of it was because the infrastructure was dismantled, the world changed in terms of what was the dominant sexy job to have, which was finance, remains finance, accumulating wealth, individual wealth, and therefore not working, and it, we, it wasn't as though we were collectives in any sense, real sense, but we worked collectively. We shared information, we shared aspiration, and we shared actions. And we trusted each other across all the normal socioeconomic, bound, all, all the socioeconomic boundaries that divide us in so many other ways, and certainly in issues around money. We all earned about the same amount of money. It was a much more equal society. And people who earned a really large amount of money or inherited it were a very, very small part of the population. I started my uh, mentoring practice in the late 90s, partly in response to the needs of young, well-educated women who wanted to find the pathways through the business world or the professional world. I didn't think of it myself. I actually was the manager of Citibank, who'd asked me to come in and do a gender survey. And he said to me, I've been the CEO of Taiwan. He was an Irish-American man. And, and I'd written something about women in the boardroom and how we couldn't see them. And he said, you know, I've been, I've been in Taiwan and I had 13 direct reports and seven of them were women and there were six nationalities. Here in Sydney, I have graduates of Sydney University economics faculty rugby team. He said, I have 11 men. They've all been to the same school, the same university. They all play rugby together. He said they are the most narrow, focused, monochrome group of people. And he said, yes, they can make a dollar on the screen, but he said, that does not enrich an organisation. And he said, I've got a couple of really smart women and I've identified them and I want you to help me do that. So he, he, he said, uh, and, I th and he said, you know, they've been fired up because I talked to every single person in the organisation. So he said, I think I'll get them a coach or, or a mentor. I never heard about coaching or mentoring at that stage. Anyway, and I said, well, that seems like a good idea. We'll give them some one-to-one -one support. They were both um, in their mid-30s and ready for leadership. And I, said, but actually, and I said to him, it is going to be tough because the men won't want them there and they're very vulnerable. He said, well, that, I'll give them the support. So he found two mature um, men who he thought would be right. And he came back to me a month later. He said, complete failure. He said, they, they say they're leaving. And he said, but they, I want you to go and talk to them. So I sat down with them and I said, what happened? They said, one of them said to me, look, this bloke, he's my father's age, he just downloaded on me like my father, you know, gave me this sort of long monologue about his life and uh, frankly, I couldn't be less interested and in how he made, you know, how he did so well in business and how easy it was and a bit of few challenges, you know, and, and the, the other one had done the same thing. And so the final moment came when he said to me, now, could I help you with your business plan when he drew breath on himself? And she said, oh, I don't think so. I've got a Harvard MBA. I don't think I need much help on my business plan. She said, uh, he said, I don't think this is, she said, I don't think this is a very helpful thing, relationship for me. And he was deeply shocked and probably quite hurt. So I said to them, well, what do you want? And they said, we want women whose shoes we can walk in. And as soon as I said that, it made sense. They said, if you can find us a woman who's battled a way through, we don't care whether it's the public or the private sector, the not-for-profit, Someone who's been able to have a baby, have a career, maintain a relationship or two along the way, and feel as though she's in mainstream work. That, that's what we want. Of course, they left the bank, but they both have made particularly um, strong careers. I found them two women, you know, 15 years older, 
who'd battled most of those, been through most of those battles, and out of that came a practice where I keep finding people. And of course, it, it's changed during that time. But one-to-one -one is quite an expensive way of getting change. But the women had to find their voices to negotiate, to be able to see a future, to be able to recognise systemic barriers. And I've thought about it since and thought one of the issues is in all the thinking of the early women's movement, we thought the perfect world was a world where there was no hierarchy, that we were all equal. Now, as the chair of Circus Oz, Circus Oz has never changed that flat leadership um, style, which is amazing and it works really well. But most other organisations don't work like that. So, how do you? So we 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 said we didn't want that. And I remember going to a well conference, the first national well conference, <coughs> as one of the delegates from Sydney Well. I was absolutely exhausted because we'd spent pretty well two days debating what leadership or what structure we should have and should we let Canberra be the lobby and we said no and we didn't believe in hierarchical leadership. And I think that's been a deep imprint on the way we see the world. I think in the 70s we, got, we raised our consciousness. In the 80s we gave a lot of work to government to do. I think we thought in the 90s the prizes, the glittering prizes of leadership would be there for us. And even in Beijing in 1995, when Hillary Clinton gave a magnificent speech about women and change, it was the biggest group, the biggest session was women in decision making. Even then we didn't call it leadership. And that's only 15 years ago. When I'd gone to the World Conference of Women in 1980, the entire conference was that most of the conversations were about family planning and reproductive rights and fertility. So there are patterns and shifts that we can see. So we've really only come strongly back into thinking about leadership. It isn't that we didn't want women in politics, we did, but we still didn't call it leadership. We said things like, put women in the house, etc. And so I think we are, the, of course, the inheritors of our own cultural expectations. I think we um, still think about, do we have our own leadership model? So when people say, you know, do women lead differently to, from men? I don't know. Some do and some don't. But I do know that the traditional stereotype male leadership model is the fashionable one. And the, the dilemma for women is, do I have to be like that to be a part of it, and it's not what I want to do or be, we have a problem. That inheritance and that identification of what it is to be female is part of the reason I think that we've got gender back on this repeat conversation. And when the Institute of Company Directors said that they were going to set up um, a mentoring program for women and men from the top, and a couple of women from the top 200 companies would be the mentors, and they would have three, four sessions to help them. I had to really rearrange my face publicly to look as though I thought this was a generous and lovely idea. Because basically, I think all we're doing is trying to change women to be like those men. And that's a limited aspiration. We don't need, we, we have to find our own way to do this. We did it so well for about 25 years and then somehow or other we got sidetracked. And I think that I look at the Defence Forces and I remember going to the head of the Defence Forces, Angus Houston, who'd come to something I'd spoken at mentoring and said, you know, I'm really interested in that. And so I went to see him and I said, you know, it would be really good for you to mentor. He told me he was about to promote two women into the senior leadership team. And I said, well, that's good. And I said, but you know, you, you'll need to give them some extra support. It's very hard to be trivialised. Look, I've had endless rewards for speaking out. But you can still be trivialised if you're one woman in a group or two out of ten. You're still the other. And 
my mentoring program is that I always have external mentors because I don't want the mentor to be in charge of the pay pack or the promotion. And, and that, you know, that's the sort of sponsorship model of mentoring where if you do as I say, and at the least generous, or I'm going to tell you how the culture works and this is the best way to operate, the more generous, you'll, get, you'll succeed. And instead, I, and I said to him, and he said, look, that's probably a really good idea. Anyway, he rang me up about two weeks later and he said, he said, I think it's a good idea, but none of my team will have anything to do with external mentors. And I said, what that means, of course, is you are mentoring for the existing culture. And look what's happening. It just gets worse every day. We're not successful in, in enabling change. We're back to that thing about women's voices. And so, Agenda's back on the agenda. There's a part of me wants to just go away and, you know, dig in the garden. And the other part of me, I'm worried about what I might find, I suppose, but there's another part of me that said, if gender's back on the agenda, I want to be part of the conversation. And I want to help organisations that want to change. And I have to, you know, I can share with you how I might not like to rearrange my face. But in, in other public forums, I'm just going to get on with it and try and change it. Because I think if you... If families have educate their daughters and their sons for careers and that, that kind of happiness and life that they think brings sharing responsibility, being able to be a responsible person in their workplace and their world and, and politics, it probably behoves those, those of us with long corporate memories um, to be quite generous. And I just want to show you a couple of slides that I often just show to people so that you have some idea about my thinking, I realised, and then we'll have some talk. Two women. I use this now. It's such a fabulous photograph. But I use it now to say one size does not fit all. These are two very different women, and they're both in leadership positions, and we need to remember that. Their family lives are different. Their pathways are different. They might both be lawyers, but they're very, very different people. They have different leadership styles, and it, they are significant role models. My seven-year-old granddaughter has that photograph at the end of her bed. Of course, I got her the colour version. <laughs> What's it look like at the moment? Mad men. When I lived in America in the 60s, that's exactly what every business my husband worked in looked like. But those women in the background were actually quite powerful. They were the gatekeepers to it all. And of course, if you've watched Mad Men, you would see, know that. And here they are again, corporate Australia. As in Mad Men, this is what the Commonwealth Bank looks like. I bank there and I keep, you know, I moved from one bank because I didn't like the look of it, but they all look the same. BHB Billiton. a long way to go. And last month, unbelievably, big, big new hedge fund. The chairman of Glencore told the Sunday Telegraph, women's capacity in the workplace was limited because they get pregnant, have a tendency not to be so involved quite often, that's because they've got, you know, rubber brains because they're pregnant, and are not so ambitious. And do you think do you think that means that when I rush out, when I'm absolutely desperate to have is a young woman who's about to get married in my company? Actually, someone should remind him it's not his company. It's a public company with many shareholders. And that I really need them on my board because I know they're going to get pregnant. Now, this man obviously has a problem with pregnancy and they're going to go off for nine months. Now, look, that is two weeks ago. Now, it did get rubbish in the Financial Times, but he didn't lose his job. I mean, no one you said that is so inappropriate. So why would any woman want to go and work there if that's the culture from the top? And here's my favourite cartoon about women's voices. <laughs> if only they could be authoritative. So if, perhaps if a man could paraphrase us, everything would be perfect. Can we do this? They go and get pregnant. Can we do it? Is it possible? We are having repeat conversations about this. It's so absurd. Did many people here watch Paper Giants on ABC? I thought one of the wonderful things about that is it showed a different pathway 
to redefining who Australian, what Australia could be. And that people, you know, strong public sector kind of feminism, which was really quite disapproving of that sort of a life, a whole lot of women suddenly got what Ita was fighting for. And I've, you know, I'm a great defender because Ita did, when she did the Women's Weekly Survey around women's right to choose, that changed every, that changed the rules for Parliament. That's how we got um, termination of pregnancy on the medical benefit schedule, Malcolm Fraser. And it, and it did make a difference. But why is work and family not possible? The themes I keep hearing about, women don't have ambition. They can't commit because they have children. Children disrupt their careers. They're not good at risk taking. And they're not good at rain making. And rain making in the professional service firms, I'm now hearing about 12 clients, big professional service firms, they're saying women just can't go out and get the contracts. They can't network. Can't network? Watch girls getting on a school bus. No, 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 talk to you, talk to you. I'll call you when I get home again. No, 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 no. They know everything. And they network. But that's not how it's seen. The barriers remain the macho cultures, the isolation, the mysterious career paths. And we still don't have equal pay. And it's pretty hard to change the world. That's another good reason to be mentoring people one-to-one -one when you work 12 or 14 hours a day and you go home. I did hear a cheery piece of news today that men have increased their contribution to household chores by six hours in the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> quite a way to go, though. And where do we go to from here? Well, I think that really um, it's, it's about... Sorry. Uh, doesn't matter, anyway. <coughs> how, do I look, how do I put that back? We just don't have life. Okay, I'll, I'll just paraphrase that. For me, I think um, we have to now make a commitment if we are going to... Thank you. That's all right. To the next slide? Yeah. I want to. No, I still want to go back one, up one, this one. Just because I think this is a good way to from here. Yeah, thanks. What I'm now saying to business and organisation is this: get over the schmaltz. I don't want to have the repeat conversation about gender. Just treat it like a business issue in business. Just start asking a few serious questions. Identify and promote female talent. CEO's got to lead it, and the board. Make sure you promote the fair share. Keep measuring, measuring, measuring. Ask questions about culture, because culture is the big thing. Pay, and how do we manage? And that means you recruit, you retain, and you reward. And if you just do that in a serious way, you will have women emerging as leaders. And mentoring alone won't do it, but mentoring will help those people who've got good experience and they're um, into doing it. Mentoring just helps you see different people and different, and different proposals. So I, won't, I think it's time that you had a chance to ask some questions. So I do just want to think, you know, I remember as a young feminist when I first read Mao's little red book and I read that women hold up half the sky. And I guess that I think if you hold up half the sky, you're entitled to half of the fun at least, half of the responsibility. And that means the opportunity to be a leader to, in whatever club that you want to play in, in the community, in religion, spirituality, in business or in government. There's heaps of room for all of us. And I regret that we have to have the conversation again. But then persistence wins in the end. So I'd encourage you all to go out and have that conversation in its contemporary 2011 form. Thank you. I'd like to invite you to ask questions of Wendy. Now we've got two persons poised with microphones that dash about the room. But wait until you get the microphone before starting your question. Um, working in arts and spirituality, I think some of our challenges is actually finding my mentors to even understand how the system works. Sorry, I can't hear any of that. You just have to speak in the microphone. Get, put, put a 
close up your mouth. Imagine you're on the ABC reading the news. Just fly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for that, Wendy. It was great because um, one of my challenges in working in arts and spirituality is actually finding the right mentors to guide you through the system. And a lot of our work is sometimes very isolating. Yes, yes so to, to find more programs where we can find opportunities to network, to also understand how the system works. I still can't hear it down, down here. Just maybe you paraphrase then, just to, or, or come a bit closer. Well, the question could be. Um, Where the airplane is, I think. You see? Is it all right? The question is uh, how do we find these opportunities to um, uh, explore our talent and to understand uh, the system? Do you have a view? Do you have a view about I'm asking. Sorry. Sometimes people ask a question and they have a view and that's a useful thing to do. So I don't know how... I, I, don't, I don't know... How, it's a sense of isolation. Is that the issue? I find belonging to a woman's group or a group in the workplace is a very good start. I think if you can find a mentor who can help you network um, in the world... That's extremely useful because if you get... Can you hear? I know I've got an old teacher's voice. And, um, I think if you can... If you say to yourself in the next five years, I want to expand the world that I work in and live in, and, I, I mean, you might go to your industry group. That's one thing. But I actually think a group, a community-based group, is a good thing to do. I think learning to meet other people of your own age, you know, give or take five years, in similar positions is extremely useful. And then meet people who are completely different. Because you won't actually see other opportunities if you just stay on a tram track. So staying... One of the things that girls do, particularly, is because they're raised to be good girls and obedient and get praise and so on, is they tend to keep going in the same direction. And most of the rest of the world that gets on doesn't do that anymore. And I think that... And, and you know, if you can't afford a paid mentoring thing, I mean, go and ask some, somebody. Just think about who, who you could learn something from. And you'll be surprised how generous people will be. Women especially, but men will also... Many men will also be quite generous about spending some time with you and helping you to find... You know, take a broader view of the world. I love the idea that all internal worlds have external light focused on them. Right here in the middle. Um, there's been a lot of aspects of feminism in the past that have ignored women who have other disprivileges working against them. So the woman of color, the woman of disability, they are of a sexual minority and so on. And because they have to deal with all these other bits of being the other, sometimes they don't feel like they have a voice within feminism. So how do they figure in this, this version of the, the gender discussion if they're still having even more of an issue fitting into institutions? I, th I think you can be an other with about seven categories, yes, and how do you find your way through that? I guess you try and do it one by one. Is that, what, is that really what the question is? Well, what if one by one isn't an option? Like, you can't separate your race from your gender, from your background. And then when, when just a uh, woman with white privilege ha find it hard enough to get through corporations and all that, when you're really disadvant when you disadvantage it even more ways, it's even harder to well, get through. Well, it is. I, no, I agree. But I, I'd say, having lived in the States for a, a, a while, that I think race was the first moment then that made you the other, as opposed to gender. You know, I, when I was living there, that was the first cut in terms of discrimination. Here in Australia, I think it's gender that makes you the other. So you have to work out which is your headline 
it might be for some people not having, share, not having got, be, got an education that keeps them outside of a mainstream. And I think whatever it is that bothers you the most or that you feel excludes you the most is the thing that you try and work on and overcome to say, I'm going to be included in this and I'm not going to permit exclusion at any stage. And it's, it's not always the obvious thing. I mean, being female is, is probably the most obvious difference. Um, but as I said, still in the States, I think it is probably as much colour as that. And of course, for people with obvious disabilities, you know, very visible disabilities, that is, the world is still a very harsh place. And that might be where you start. And, and, and gender probably often doesn't matter. My experience working with women with disabilities that it's the disability that comes first rather that, that excludes them, be, rather than the gender, even though they've got a double, a double um, reason for being excluded. But it is the disability. Does that answer your question? Not really? Try. Well, in you my experience, you, you can't, there is no headline. No, there is no answer. There is no headline. You'll be excluded in one group for one thing, in another group for another thing, and then there's really nowhere else for you to go. There is no headline. But the, in, in, in the end, if there's any solution as opposed to answer, it is education. Education is the only thing that takes us out of ghettos. Ghettos of narrow-minded thinking, of prejudice, of poverty, that is the biggest breakthrough ever. And education is one of the few gifts that no one can take from you. People can take back other gifts, but when you've got an education, you've got something that is precious and yours. And for me, that's the absolute bottom line for women of all kinds of backgrounds. Once you've got an education, there's something that enables you to stand up and confront. At the back there. Yeah, hello. Um, hi, I'm, my name is Tal. I'm the newly appointed leadership coordinator at Volunteering Queensland. And you touched on one of my biggest concerns, which is that young women really take for granted all the rights that they have these days that you and other amazing women fought for. Um, I'm looking to develop a leadership um, program for young women and I'd love to pick your brain sometime. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I'm having so much trouble here. Did you hear that? Yes, she wants, to pick your, she wants to pick your brains because she's about to develop the leadership program at uh, Volunteering Queensland, is it called? Yeah, that's yeah. right, Volunteering Queensland. And she'd like to pick your brains about it. Okay. <laughs> Not right now, but... <laughs> I think the first question you need to ask is, is, is leadership different for men and women? I mean, I'm, I'm getting a bit over all these special courses for women's leadership because you know what's do, what it's doing? Is women are learning leadership over here together? Men are doing leadership here. And guess who's getting the prizes? So my first thing is, I wouldn't be doing just women's leadership. I'm not going to do it anymore. I want people to learn together. And the moment that I realised that, that I was doing it wrongly, doing too much women's leadership stuff, it just doesn't mean there isn't a thing about getting... You, you might have some, a couple of separate sessions if you want. But far more interesting to have a whole conversation is when... There was a seminar for, on rheumatology, of all things, and the doctors said that they wanted to have their own seminar and the nurses would have their own. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, because we're doctors. <laughs> and I said, but the nurses will be doing most of the work. And they said, well, the nurses wouldn't understand it. I said, well, I think they would. Every nurse in this group is university educated. And they said, well, that was a mistake. <laughs> I said, well, we won't go with that argument for the moment. Meanwhile. It will be a combined group. There'll be one program on rheumatology and you will, either, you will either go to that and do it together or you'll have to go on and have your own education offline. And that's when I start to think that if you start to put us back into ghettos again, you've got to, fight, you've got to find new pathways to bring us back together and it, it's not worth it. So I would definitely be looking at a combined leadership and I'd be having the first discussions about what could leadership mean and why, I'd, and I'd be looking at the numbers. I'd be looking at who leads, who's on, the, who's on the boards. Interestingly, the Australian Bureau of Statistics does not, 
It measures people on corporate boards and university leadership now and educational boards, but it does not do not-for-profit. So volunteering, we don't know. We only guess about who volunteers, and that's pretty unreliable information. So I'd be looking at the numbers of who comes and where they come from and what their challenges are in leadership and try and help them answer the question. I think we've got uh, time for probably only one more question. Um, we'll perhaps two if they're quick. We've got a gentleman down the front and uh, the lady in the middle. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. I just okay. popped my ears. I think it's because I came on a plane too late. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned it's like... Just keep a your new... microphone near your mouth. Okay, you mentioned it's like a new argument, an old argument that's been renewed because things have shifted culturally and that now the power careers of finance and, and possibly technology is probably something you'd add to that as well, which is strongly male-dominated. Um, I, I have four degrees and, and I've, I've worked in um, sectors where there's a strong male culture. I've also gone for jobs in places where there's strong male culture. Um, I found a lot of the barriers um, are that there are a lot of men who don't have education very high up in the hierarchy and they actually find you a threat if you do men have... don't see... They, they, they don't have education, some of the men who have been a long time in their careers high up in the hierarchy. If you're a woman with education, that's actually threatening um, and they treat you as an inferior or they try and find ways in which to find your education as a negative. So I find that that's one of the major problems within that, that culture as well. Mm. I, I used to... I worked with a man in family planning for a while who said... Um, who used to say constantly, I'm not available for um, exploitation, I'm not available to be patronised, and if you treat me that way, I'm, uh, I can't hear what you're saying, and I just won't, I won't deal with it. And it, it, I, I tried the lines when I was working in situations like that, and I found that they worked really well. <laughs> and actually one line, you know, just having one line some of these things is a really helpful thing to do. You don't need a long explanation about the history of feminism or anything else. Just say, don't, don't speak to me like that. Um, can you hear me? It's a Have you tried? To work. Yeah, OK, I understand what you mean, but I guess if these people are actually over you, they're not accepting that wine line. It's a threat to their authority and that they're, they're, like I've experienced, it's persistent. They have a persistent attitude. I'm just wondering where what's driving that attitude. Maybe you should take them the cartoon about women's voices. <laughs> Maybe you should put it up and put it up somewhere in the staff room and say, you know, well, does anyone recognise this syndrome? Because mm -hmm. they're paraphrasing you, are they? No, not paraphrasing me. They, they just, just find, ignore. They just find the fact that a woman who is educated when they're not and they've been in that you're talking about, you know, being long in long term in the actual job, and you know, versus merit. So they have an attitude that they've been in there a long time and that that's equivalent to a great deal of education, and, and it is to some degree, but they don't want to accept, um, you know, a, a degree of education because they actually find that quite threatening. Um, that's what I find wi within the, the male hierarchies, but, yeah. <laughs> Keep at it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks. There's a microphone at the very back there. If we could get a microphone down here, because the gentleman in the front row has got a question. We probably should restore some gender balance, but we'll take the question <laughs> at the back up there. Um, I had a question. You talked about uh, women and men's leadership, and I wondered if you felt that differed from masculine or feminine forms of leadership. I felt this morning's presentation about crowdsourcing by IDO could be seen as more feminine forms of leadership or management in the fact that it was inclusive, collaborative, intuitive... Um, letting go of ego, they said, and this idea of sharing ideas and building upon them. Um, and I wondered if you could talk to that a little bit. You want me to paraphrase, don't you? Um, <laughs> how would you summarise your question? Um, well, I just wonder about whether I... S I would like to see new ways of doing leadership and that there can be a more feminine way, one might say, of how we lead. So, in Okay, well, let me, let me say that I think that there's a lot of documentation now, and, in fact, there was one major study that went on for 10 years, which is a really interesting piece of um, work on how women lead and manage, that showed of the 11 indicators in the world that were considered important, women won on nine, and they were collaborative, they listened... Uh, they didn't play out 
whatever version of testosterone they had on the stock market. That didn't mean they didn't make money and that the companies that they were, there was strong women's influence in management and leadership performed better through the global financial crisis. Interestingly, the data wasn't released for quite a while. But the two things that women did not score well on were both about envisioning. In, and that was that they didn't put to the companies they worked on that idea of a vision out front that everyone was to go towards. They didn't, they didn't think in a big way about changing it. They thought maybe a year ahead, but they didn't think five years ahead. So some bloke who came, came along and said, this is what we'll be doing, you know, we'll have three new car models in five years. The women will be saying, yeah, I think we'll probably have a new car model this year, you know, and we'll do that. And when we look at that, we'll see what needs to be done there. So that sense of, it, it's really about incremental change as opposed to radical change in management, which of course makes for much more steady organisations. But it, 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 you can find the article in McKinsey's, it's a really, in their quarterly journal, that end of last year, I think, it's a really interesting piece of work with about 12,000 women, uh, companies responding, including the women, and that shows that, and it also showed that most of the men working side by side, these women, were very happy to work with them, which throws every stereotype away. Hi, Wendy. Um, I just wanted to have a chance to almost like rephrase the... I can't the, even hear you and you've got a boy's voice. I, I, I wanted oh, to... I, I wanted to re rephrase the, the issue, I guess. Um, like, from my perspective, I'm, I'm Gen Y. Uh, I, was, I was raised by a, quite a, a feminist mother and so I, I can cook and clean just, just as well as anyone else. Um, but I find, I find the issue isn't so much um, women versus men these days. I think it's more... more um, the older generations versus the younger generations. And I think all those issues that you brought up are very valid, but they're also very valid for, for young people in general. Um, and, I, and I think we have a voice, and a, a, like a voice that people should pay attention to, um, just because like, like the, the difference between younger generations and older generations is most notably um, like technology and, and how, how young people are, are generally I guess more senior in their knowledge of technology than, than older people are, and I think I think some of their their voice should be heard in management as as younger people. And I think it's not just the woman man deba debate. I th well, we we don't have time to have a big conversation about Gen Y, etc. But I think that in terms of using technology, there's a very interesting program which I was a part of on Life Matters this morning about when should people have children. And the assumptions that turned out not to be correct was if you kept deferring birth, that you could rely on technology to assist and everything would be fine. I think we're finding out that that is not a very reliable use of technology. I think that bringing a world closer, which technology has done, has fulfilled the promise of you know, the global village in a way that we never dreamt of. I think what we don't know with Gen Y yet is how you're going to build families, how that you know how you're going to couple and birth, and when you're going to do it, and what impact that's going to make on the way you see the world. I love Gen Y. That's okay. You know, it's not that I, I, I'm not trying to sound like an old bat when I say that, but I am trying to say that I think there'll be issues around communicating uh, in staccato not very meaningful, not very well thought out ways, that, that, that the immediacy of that, which you may find, God forbid, that you grow out of. <laughs> His phone's ringing as I say it. Someone's <laughs> tweeting him. <laughs> I'm sorry to the people who didn't get a chance to ask a question, but uh, we've got a bit of a deadline, and uh, this, sort of, uh, this topic certainly is one that we could be chatting about for uh, hours to go. Can I ask you instead, as we bring the occasion to an end, to, Warmly thank Wendy McCarthy.